So we're going to go to Matthew chapter 6, verse 1 to 18. Uh, for all those, all those who don't know me, my name is Bron. Uh, I um, oversee the Chapel Collective with my husband, Darren. And uh, so that's why I pop up on the screen and in location here and there, if you've ever wondered. Let's go to Matthew chapter 6, verse 1 to 18. I'm going to be reading from the NET this morning. Matthew 6, be careful. This is Jesus talking, not to display your righteousness merely to be seen by people. Otherwise, you have no reward with your father in heaven. Thus, whenever you do charitable giving, do not blow a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in synagogues and on streets so that people will praise them. I tell you the truth, they have their reward. But when you do your giving, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your gift may be in secret and your father who sees in secret will reward you. Whenever you pray, do not be like the hypocrites because they love to pray while standing in synagogues and on street corners so that people can see them. Truly, I say to you, they have their reward. But whenever you pray, go into your inner room, close the door and pray to your father in secret and your father who sees in secret will reward you. When you pray, do not babble repetitiously like the Gentiles, because they think that by their many words they will be heard. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask them. So pray this way. Our Father in heaven, may your name be honoured. May your kingdom come. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we ourselves have forgiven our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For if you forgive others their sins, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, your Father will not forgive you your sins. When you fast, do not look sullen like the hypocrites, for they make their faces unattractive so that people will see them fasting. I tell you the truth, they have their reward. When you fast, anoint your head and wash your face so that it will not be obvious to others when you are fasting, but only to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. We've just been reading the gospel, the good news about Jesus Christ according to Matthew. And all those four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, are apologetics, if you will. They are uh, books written to say, hey, this is our eyewitness testimony of who Jesus was, the works, the ways and the words of Jesus, if you will. And so they are giving an apologetic. They're giving proof of what they saw and heard and why they believe that he's the son of God and why they believe he's the saviour of the world. To this point in Matthew, firstly, he's given some overall background of Jesus' life as a child and how that came about. And, and then he's talked about how Jesus got baptised uh, down with John the Baptist. Uh, then he talks about the spirit leading Jesus into the wilderness for 40 days um, and it, it actually says to be tempted by the devil. Uh, and then it talks about he begins to preach. And then it says that he calls a few of his disciples. And then it says that he begins to go around healing. So then, of course, the crowds follow. And then what we just read is part of the largest recorded sermon that Jesus gives, which is known as the Sermon on the Mount. He goes up some kind of hill, the crowds follow, and he preaches a long sermon to them. He starts with what's called the Beatitudes. This is actually just uh, the rethink. This is the turning the world upside down, the upside down kingdom um, blessing. It's rewriting the script. It's where we see all the blessed other, blessed other, those people who are poor, blessed other. It's flipping everything on its head. It's incredible. Uh, and then he goes on to say that he's come to fulfill the law and the prophets, but then he goes on and kind of uh, undoes that as well. He doesn't undo it, he fulfills it by saying it's not just about what you do and how you obey. It, actually, he brings everyone to the same level because he says it's about what you're thinking. And so what's written later in Romans that all have sinned and all have fallen short of the glory of God, then that with by that measure, what goes on in our minds, we can say that, yes, that's absolutely true. Then he gets into the actions of what he wants them to do. And that's where we take up. He finishes up by saying, don't store up for yourselves treasures on here on earth. Don't worry and don't judge. And then he talks a little bit about the nature of God, the nature of the kingdom, gives us some motivational words about building our lives on what he's just said. And uh, then he continues his ministry. But right in the middle are these three when use, when you give. He, the assumption is that we will give charitably. We will give generously, specifically 
to the poor. That will be part of our lives, giving to the poor. Uh, he says when we pray, he, the assumption is we are going to pray, so don't carry on and go forever. Pray um, because God already knows, but, but still pray, still ask, but you don't need to carry on. And then he says when you fast, when you fast. Now, we are heading in as the Chapel Collective into 21 days of prayer and fasting starting tomorrow. And, and you, this might be a completely foreign concept to you or you might be a regular faster. But the fact is, is that fasting is all through the Old Testament. It is all through the New Testament of our Bible. It is all through early church history. In fact, all through all of church history. It's really only in the Western world in the last 100 years where it's fallen off the grid. Uh, this could potentially be because we have so much food marketed to us and, and food is at our fingertips all the time that, 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 that it's just kind of we think completely differently about food now. But the ancients, oh, everyone fasted, the, the early church fathers, everyone fasted, and, and, and that's not even like Jesus fasted. That's how important it is. If, if we might say, well, we don't really need to fast, Jesus needed to fast. And so we're going to head into a season of fasting and I want to talk to us a little bit about that because we can have various feelings about that, various misunderstandings about that. The Bible, Jesus goes on to say just a little while after that sermon, he gets accused again. Jesus constantly gets misunderstood and accused of doing the wrong thing when he's just turning the world upside down and doing the right thing. And in Matthew chapter 9, uh, even his friends come to him and he, the disciples of John the Baptist, his cousin, and they say to him, hey, how come we fast and how come the Pharisees fast but your disciples don't? You guys are just like partying on. <laughs> Why is that? And Jesus doesn't say, well, that's the new covenant that I'm bringing in. No one needs to fast ever again. Now, he gives a very different answer in Matthew chapter 9, verse 14 and 15. It says, then John's disciples came to Jesus and asked, why do we and the Pharisees fast often, but your disciples don't fast? Jesus said to them, the wedding guests cannot mourn while the bridegroom is with them, can they? But the days are coming when the bridegroom will be taken from them and then they will fast. He doesn't say, fasting is done and dusted. He says, when I go, they will fast. And guess what? Jesus still has not returned. We are his disciples. And so Jesus says, we will fast. So we're honing in on this. We're honing in on this because it's a little talked about practice. And yet to be a New Testament Christian, it is part of living life. Now, if you're visiting here today and you're like, oh my gosh, <laughs> I've just come here. I just finally said yes. Or maybe you're the person that invited me. You're like, they just finally said yes, Bron. And you know, you're going to talk about fasting. Hey, if you're, if you're not convinced about Jesus or anything like that, or you're very early on the page, just take this as information. And, and just follow the, the, the trajectory, see what we talk about, see if you find it interesting uh, and, and, and don't feel any compulsion or any pressure. No one should feel any pressure about this. This is an invitation that we're given. And so we're going we're gonna to look at that. So let's pray before we head into it. Mighty God, we just thank you. Um, Lord, that you said we will fast. Uh, I don't know why I'm thanking you for that, but I thank you because, because you've always got a reason and a purpose and it's always for good. And so, God, if you've asked us to fast, Lord, you want us to, uh, there's something about it that is good for us. And so, God, I pray that you would enlighten us for that, that you would help us to see that today through your word and that we would, um, that Lord, you would speak to us about the kind of fast you want us to do. And Lord, we would listen and obey. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Let me tell you about last year's fast. We do this every year at this time of year. We kind of let uh, January happen and all the holidaying and everything that we do. And then we come back in February. And we're like, right, 21 days of prayer and fasting. And we have Vision Sunday in and around that. And as you might have already had it announced, it's happening next week on the 11th of February. Uh, so we fast in and around that. We fast um, for 21 days. Now, it looks different for everybody. And across the years, I've done various types of fasts. I actually love this time of year. Uh, if you've heard me um, preach for any length of time, you would know that my relationship with food is fraught with, mm, I don't even know what to say, 
weirdness. <laughs> I'm an emotional eater, meaning if I have an emotion, I eat. And and But somehow at this time of year, I'm generally able to be really disciplined. The other thing that happens is, and I'm telling you, this is supernatural. This does not happen at all. Everything pertaining to health across my life apart from this is like a really hard slog. But for some reason during these three weeks, I get up early, like 5.30 every morning. I walk to church. I pray with whoever's there. And I have all this energy and this excitement and I love it. Now, last year, uh, it was fully hectic in our household. Um, we were waiting on all kinds of news and, and we didn't know what the future looked like. We were trusting God with everything. But I was like, you know what? I'm going to do a full fast this year, water only. I'd done veggie fasts. I'd done ju juice fasts. I'd done um, no sugar fasts. I'd done all sorts of things. But I was like, you know what? I feel prepped. I really want to do a full fast this year, water only. I kind of even positioned myself that in January, I didn't have any sugar and I didn't have any alcohol. So I thought when we head into this fast, I'm not going to have all those crazy withdrawals or anything like that. I tell you, I got five days into the fast. I, my mouth started filling with ulcers. I was like, I was in all sorts. We're heading down to Sydney. I'm like, I, I think I'm dying. Not really, but I felt really bad. And I broke my fast. I went back on sugar. I let everything go back. It was an epic fail as far as 21 day full fasts go. Um, fortunately, Christelle called me and said, Bron, I just really don't think you should be fasting right now. Your world is in turmoil and, and now's not the time for you to fast. I was like, sweet permission. No worries. And I didn't fast. It's like there's a weird relationship that can happen with fasting there. Like is a failure mean that I'm a failure? What does that look like? I've heard, told many the story about Katie before that actually Jules, when Jules was kids pastor, that she encouraged the kids, okay, what are you going to fast? What's your fast going to look like? Uh, now, just stay with me if you're like, you told your kids that they couldn't eat food? Just stay with me. We're going to talk a little bit more about fasting and the different types of fast in a moment. But Jules encouraged the kids and my little girl Katie in infants or early primary, decided that she was going to fast afternoon tea. Now, if you're a school student, you know you eat lunch at recess and then you just play all lunch. And so when you get home, you're starving. So Kate had decided that she was going to not eat um, afternoon tea, gets home uh, for many days, just not having afternoon tea. Uh, Kate also was allergic to mozzies at the time, mosquito bites. When she would get bitten by a mosquito, she would... Um, swell up like she'd been bitten by a rabid dog, uh, but she was she she was getting these massive um, mozzie bites. One night she comes in, and, and like we hated poor little Katie going through this, darling girl. Like it was awful to see her just have these massive lumps all over just from a simple mosquito bite. We'd 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 change their beds around. We put Lockie on the top bunk and Kate on the bottom bunk. We're like Lockie, you're sleeping in your undies tonight. It's February. You'll be fine. Like mozzies, come get him. Just leave Kate alone. But Kate comes into our room in the middle of the night and says, "Mum, there's a buzzing in my room. There's bees in my room. They're buzzing everywhere." And I'm, oh, sweetie, I'm so sorry. That's not bees. That's mosquitoes, and they're coming after you again. And uh, and Daz had just kind of gone into her bed, and Katie crawled into bed with me, and she said, "Mum, why do the mosquitoes just want to get me all the time?" I said, "Oh, Katie, it must be something in your blood. They just they like your blood better than anyone else's. I'm so sorry." She went, "No, Mum, I think I know why. I think I know why the mosquitoes are getting me." I said, "What is it, Katie?" And she said, "It's because of the nerds." I said, "The nerds?" She said, "Yeah, I'm so hungry in the afternoons that I've been sneaking my Christmas nerds." Nerds are these teeny tiny pieces of candy. And Katie was that hungry because of a fast that she'd gone into a room and snuck a few little nerds and now thinks that God is out to get her and is punishing her by sending a plague of mosquitoes. Can you see how fasting can be fraught with misunderstanding? Oh man, fortunately she had a mum who could tell her that God is good and kind and that's not what he does and that's not what he's like. And so... Uh, Motivation can be weird when it comes to fasting. Misunderstandings can be rife. And you can fast, as Jesus just said, with completely the wrong attitude. Fasting is not a mark of spiritual maturity. Uh, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And doesn't say, and by the way, fasting as well. If you're really spiritual mature, spiritually mature, if the spirits are working in your life, gee, you'll be a faster. Fasting is not a mark of spiritual maturity. Love is. <laughs> but fasting is a practice like prayer, like worship, like reading the word, 
uh, like stillness, uh, like like rest, uh, practices that enable us to experience intimacy with God that then leads us to maturity. That is how it works. But you can be full of pride about it. And you, you, Jesus is just saying that these guys, the Pharisees, man, they let everybody know how much they fast and they see it as a sign of how good they are. That is not how fasting is supposed to work in any way, shape or form. Fasting, what is it first? Fasting is going without food. I know, I've just lost 80% of the room. <laughs> fasting is going without food. We're going to talk about different types of fast, but, but the true definition of fasting is going without food. A full, full fast is going without food and having water only. And let me encourage you, if that's the kind of fast that God is leading you into this fasting season, double your intake of water. That's what I did wrong with my fast last year. I just kept to the two liters, which is not actually apparently even enough for me at the best of times. But without food, I got severely dehydrated, hence the ulcers in my mouth plus stress. Excellent. Great times. Double the amount of water. Um, but, but there's also partial fasts. Um, many places in Africa regularly um, fast from six till six, just those daylight hours. Uh, lots of people do that. Jew, um, Jewish fasting had a lot of that as well. Um, partial fast, missing a meal, that is also fasting. And, uh, and also, um, and, and there's a bit of controversy about this, some people don't like it, but missing certain types of food, food that you love, uh, can also be referred to as fasting. You need to, like technically it is, you need to fast sugar or you need to fast whatever it might be. So God might lead you into any one of these types of fasts. But if you're like, Bron, I just, you know, I'm diabetic or um, I've got this weird relationship with food and, and this is all a bit much for me, I would pray and ask God about what kind of fast, what you could fast from that maybe isn't related to food. Technically, it's not a fast if we're going to be all religious, but that's not what we do around here. So if you want to fast social media, if you want to fast your screen time, if you want to fast your phone full stop, apart from work hours, whatever it might look like, TV, Netflix, whatever, you can choose to fast from those things as well. That's what we're talking about when we're saying fasting. Ask the Holy Spirit and consult your doctor. They're the, they're the, they're the guides. Ask the Holy Spirit, what kind of fast should I do? And then if it's relevant and you have some kind of condition, consult your doctor about that. So let's talk about this. Jesus fasted. Jesus fasted. He was led by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness uh, to be tempted by the devil. So that was obviously about overcoming. And and he fasted for that whole time, 40 days and 40 nights. In Matthew 4, 1 to 11, you can read about it. In Mark 1, 12 to 13, you can read about it. And in Luke 1, 1 to 13, you can read about it. Chris Hodges says four things about Jesus' fast. He says what happened there was an absolute physical dependency upon the supernatural power of God for the ability to remain alive. That was the first thing that happened. Number two, there was perfect subjugation of the flesh. Okay, so what do I mean by that? That's two kind of words that we don't use so much. The we, are, we are physical beings. We have appetites. We have desires. We have um, hunger. We have physical responses. And what happened with Jesus is that all of that was turned down and came into subjugation or was put into obedience or put under his spiritual nature rather than the physical nature. So including the will and desires of the body in order to face the enemy. He was about to face the enemy, so he got rid of those human desires and amplified his spiritual desire. Number three, there was victory in spiritual warfare through the ministry of the confessed word. That happened during Jesus' fast, remember? Um, the devil even wanted him to turn stones into bread and eat, and he, he confessed the word back. The devil wanted him to uh, jump off a ledge and, 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 and test God, and Jesus quoted the word back. The devil wanted to give him all sorts of kingdoms, and Jesus quoted the word back. He, he conquered him. And then number four, this is cool, angelic ministry for refreshing and supply. That happened to Jesus. Now, I'm not suggesting to you that if you do a 40-day full fast, this will happen to you. I'm just saying that this is what happened to Jesus, and it's pretty sick. Um, so in the Old Testament and the New Testament, as I mentioned, fasting is all through it. It's everywhere. It's at times of desperation. For example, with Esther, when she had to go and see the king about um, not fulfilling a, a bad dude's um, 
thing that he a thing that he wanted to carry out. It, it happened through in, in times of desperation. It happened in times of transition from different leaders. It happened uh, about the future in Nehemiah's time. There are all these different times of fasting in the Old Testament, but also in the New. Um, when they set apart Saul and Barnabas to uh, go in a certain direction, there was fasting attached to that. The early church fasted. In fact, until very recently, and we're talking, you know, a couple of hundred of year, hundred years, Christians fasted every Wednesday and every Friday. They would fast until sundown. And it was to, number one, identify it was with Jesus' suffering, the day he was betrayed on the Wednesday, and then also his crucifixion. This has just kind of dropped off the radar of Western church, and, uh, and we're trying to bring it back. So uh, starting with this 21 days. Um, being a New Testament Christian involves fasting. For me, fasting was uh, a tricky thing because of this relationship with food you know, dieting, uh, wanting to lose weight, um, whatever it looked like. I, th I thought, oh, I can't have any of that attached to my spiritual fast. Like that, that's, I can't think about that. I can't think about the health benefits and, and I can't think about losing weight because that's, that's fleshly and that's bad. Uh, but actually I was subscribing to, you know, what's called Gnosticism, which was existed in the ancient world where People thought that everything physical was bad and it was all awful, but everything spiritual was good. And, and Paul writes to that numerous times in the, in the New Testament. It, there was this kind of dualism of bad body, great spirit, and, and, and even went so far as those people said that Jesus was not fully man. He couldn't have been because the body is bad and we don't like it. And, and we see it outworked in things like... Um, the, the, the where Catholics punished themselves and, and, and harmed themselves in order to confess sin and to, um, to do the right thing by God. It's just, yeah, it's just not right. So fasting for me, I was like, I was almost subscribing to that, but here's the thing about it. You are a physical being. You are a whole and complete body. Uh, you have a spirit. And you have a body and that's okay. And so if there are health benefits to fasting, what we actually should be is not surprised by that. Of course, if God calls us into something, if it has a positive impact on our spirit, we would expect that to have a positive impact on our whole life, including our health. It's, it's this beautiful um, thing that God does where he doesn't leave any part of us out. He's doing good things the whole way through. And there are incredible medical health benefits. I'm not going to go into any of that today, but you can read about them if you like, um, just by doing a simple Google search. But what it does do, so even though it's not like that we're, we're one body and, and we have a spirit, but it brings our, like just like it did with Jesus, it brings our earthly desires and our human appetites under the influence of the spiritual. It says a couple of things. So when we fast, we're, we're going to look at three things to start with age. I couldn't get the third one to start with age. It's okay. The first one is we need to come with humility. As um, Jesus said, a, a possibility of fasting is that we get prideful in our fasting. Well, we don't want to get prideful. And so we want to ensure that from the jump, we're coming at it with humility. The whole thing is incredibly humbling. Refusing our um, appetites is incredibly humbling. And, and so we come and, and we say to God, like, firstly, we ask God, God, can you show me what kind of fast you want me to do? Now, let me just pause there for a second. If you've never fasted before, don't jump into a full you know, seven day full fast or anything like that. Just think about missing a meal. Uh, and maybe you want to miss a meal every day. Um, but just think about starting slowly because if Jesus doesn't come back, we're on this earth for a fair while longer. So we've got a lot of opportunity to grow in this practice. Start small. Um, but ask God to show you what kind of fast do you want me to do, Lord? And I believe he'll speak to you 100% do. Um, then come again with humility and bring before him any unconfessed sin. You might think, Bro, no, I've got that much sin. That's okay. Currently, it might be unconfessed. Just confess it all to God. Uh, you, may not, you may not quit on it all right away, but just keep confessing it. Every day, bring any unconfessed sin to God. Bring any areas of judgment that you might have um, and, and submit them to God as well and repent from them. Uh, bring any gods that you have before God. If you're like you know, all about your car or all about your house or whatever it might be, bring it all before God and lay those down before him and say, God, you're the most important. Bring any areas of unforgiveness to God and pray 
God, let there be less of me and more of you. Secondly, hunger. You know, of course, obviously, <laughs> you're like, you had to bring it up, Bron. I don't even want to think about the hunger. Hunger comes in waves, right? It just does. That's what it does. Well, as it hits, as your hunger hits, say, right now, God, I hunger for a Krispy Kreme donut. Or I, or I'm hungering for that coffee that because I've given up caffeine for 21 days or whatever it might be. Or, boy, God, I want a glass of wine tonight or whatever it is. But, God, I hunger more for you than I hunger for that cup of coffee. I hunger more for you than I hunger for lunch. And align your hunger to hungering after God with everything. I hunger for you more than I hunger for that. And thirdly and finally, dig deep wells. Dig deep wells. Every practice, every spiritual practice, worship, prayer, um, the word, whatever it is, fasting as well is about closeness with God. You might say, Brian, I don't feel God. I never feel God. I encourage you in this fasting time, take some time to be still and, and ask God, say, God, I just want to be close with you and see what happens. Bring everything into alignment. Seek his face and not his hand. It's too easy during a fasting time to say, this is what I want the outcome to be. I want this healing or I want this um, financial breakthrough and, and absolutely pray for those things. But more than anything else, seek his face, seek his presence, seek his face and not his hand. Seek him and not what he can do for you. I'm going to read one prayer and uh, you can get a copy of this prayer from your location pastor or somewhere there. But I encourage you, if this is, you're like, I, I, I barely even pray, Bron. Even if you just take this prayer and pray it every day during this 21 days, I believe you'll see marvelous breakthrough. So just in closing, this is written by um, a cardinal centuries ago. Oh, Jesus, meek and humble of heart, hear me. So even there, he's not going for the power of God. He's saying, Jesus, meek and humble of heart, the God who I come to and get rest, hear me. From the desire of being esteemed, deliver me, Jesus. From the desire of being loved, deliver me, Jesus. From the desire of being extolled, deliver me, Jesus. From the desire of being honoured, deliver me, Jesus. From the desire of being praised, deliver me, Jesus. From the desire of being preferred, deliver me, Jesus. From the desire of being consulted, deliver me, Jesus. From the desire of being approved, deliver me, Jesus. From the fear of being humiliated, deliver me, Jesus. From the fear of being despised, deliver me, Jesus. From the fear of suffering rebukes, deliver me, Jesus. From the fear of being calumniated, deliver me, Jesus. It's just calamity coming upon you. From the fear of being forgotten, deliver me, Jesus. From the fear of being ridiculed, deliver me, Jesus. From the fear of being wronged, deliver me, Jesus. From the fear of being suspected, deliver me, Jesus. That others may be loved more than I, Jesus, grant me the grace to desire it. That others may be esteemed more than I, Jesus, grant me the grace to desire it. That in the opinion of the world, others may increase and I may decrease, Jesus, grant me the grace to desire it. That others may be chosen and I I set aside, grant me the grace, Jesus, to desire it, that others may be praised and I unnoticed, Jesus, grant me the grace to desire it, that others may be preferred to me in everything, Jesus, grant me the grace to desire it, that others may become holier than I, provided that I may become as holy as I should, Jesus, grant me the grace to desire it. Ask God, how do you want me to fast? And let's enjoy this time together and look forward to the testimonies. Amen.